of the year. Um, and as we uh, allowing everybody to come in, I just want to take this opportunity um, just to thank the team that has been working behind the scenes, uh, putting this wonderful Wednesday program together. Uh, our team from Room to Grow, uh, who have been a great support of the program, um, sponsoring some of our, our talks, uh, making it possible for us to get together every second Wednesday of the month and um, to be able to learn and share all the beautiful things that nature has to offer to all of us. I also want to thank uh, Straight Nature, Belinda and her team for always being so diligent and dedicated and working tirelessly behind the scene, making sure that everything is running smoothly. Our team from Kistenbosch uh, coming in, um, you know, and obviously facilitating the program. Uh, but all of this, um, you know, we, we owe uh, a large and a big thanks, um, uh, Peter, to Kathy, uh, who is the program coordinator, who, who finds all the wonderful speakers that we have in the program uh, and really rallies behind them and, you know, get them to come and share all the beautiful work that they do with us. So starting with those just few opening remarks, I just want to thank everybody for just being here with us this morning. This is our last talk of the year. And as we're about to enter into this fantastic program of today, um, I just want to wish everybody a blessed festive season. And we wish everybody prosperity in 2021. This has been one of the most difficult years that we've had um, as a country, as the world, uh, with a pandemic looming. We wish everybody to stay safe uh, during these uh, difficult times, uh, but equally we'd like everybody to just continue staying strong, um, supporting one another, and um, just uh, looking ahead and looking forward to more positive things to come. The numbers are going up. Uh, Peter, how are you feeling? Are you ready for the talk? Oh, terribly apprehensive. <laughs> I like it when you say terribly. You don't look anything terribly apprehensive about anything. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's it's always strange talking to a disembodied computer, you know, there's, there's people out there, but uh, I, I don't know who they are or where they are. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a very different experience to giving a talk live. No, definitely. I think we're just about to uh, get going as well. So I don't think I'm going to waste any more time. Uh, I'm going to just shoot straight to um, welcoming our speaker for, the, for, for today, uh, Professor Peter Ryan has a long association with the uh, Fitzpatrick Institutes of Africa Ornithology, studying the impact of plastic ingestion on seabeds. Um, he's got great passion about birds, and in particular seabeds, and today he's going to be talking to us about that. Um, he has achieved his PhD, um, and he's returned to UCT to coordinate the Institute's master's program in conservation biology, a role he continued until he took part as a director in 2013. Today we've got beautiful books that he will be uh, sharing some of the research that he's done. Uh, as you can see, one of the best that I've, uh, the books that I've got here. Uh, this book will be on sale um, and we'll give you more details just at the end of the talk. So please, um, uh, stay tuned to hear all about it. So without any waste of time, I don't want to take too much time. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody for joining us for the last Wednesday talk. The next Wednesday talk will be uh, on the last Wednesday of January in 2021, and we'll give you more details about that. This talk is going live on Facebook. We'll be sharing this live video also on our YouTube channel. So please make sure to go and like the Strake Nature Facebook page, as well as the Kistenbosch Facebook page. We also have Room to Grow Landscaping. Uh, please go ahead and like that page as well. Without any waste of time, Prof. Peter Ryan is in the house. He's going to talk to us about the world of beds, particularly seabeds. Uh, this is going to be an exciting one. So welcome, everybody. I will see you guys on the other side. Peter, over to you. Take it away. 
Yeah, thanks very much, John, and welcome everyone. Thanks for taking the time to listen to some of my stories about seabirds. Um, oh, and we've got our first little hiccup. There we go. All right. So we live on the blue planet, and I, I love this image. Um, last year, I was fortunate before the COVID lockdown to actually travel to the South Pacific. And if you hover above the South Pacific, the whole planet looks blue. So as you know, uh, about 71% of the Earth's surface is covered by ocean. Um, and as a result, um, you know, we, we really should be looking at diversity in the sea, perhaps even more than we look at diversity on land. In terms of birds, which are my particular uh, passion, there are relatively few marine birds. Only about 350 of the 10,000 birds in the world live in the sea or make their living by feeding in the sea, which is about just over 3% which is fairly modest. But if you compare uh, marine birds to marine mammals and marine reptiles, there are actually proportionally and absolutely more species of seabirds than there are marine mammals or reptiles. Obviously, all of these groups are secondarily marine, so they've evolved from terrestrial ancestors. And in the case of birds, they remain tied to land for breeding because they haven't uh, managed to get over the, the potential handicap, I guess, of laying an egg. And the reason why they're perhaps more marine birds and why marine birds are so successful is that they have several adaptations to living in a marine environment. And one of the biggest challenges for um, vertebrates coming from a terrestrial system, as we know, if you read harrowing stories of people getting lost at sea, um, one of the biggest problems is, is the salt problem in the ocean. Uh, and seabirds get around this by having special salt glands um, which sit above the eye socket and secrete a, a highly concentrated sodium chloride solution which dribbles down out of the nostrils and forms a little drip on the tip of the bill. Often you'll see gulls and other birds. Um, and this is how they get around the problem that we would face if we had to drink seawater. We actually end up excreting more water to get rid of the excess salt that we take in. So it's a net loss to our body if we drink seawater. But seabirds can happily eat food that's packed with salt and even drink seawater and make a net profit out of it because of these amazing salt glands. And this is a common feature that they share with marine reptiles. Uh, most birds have these things, just the passerines don't, um, but mammals don't have them. Uh, and that's possibly one of the reasons why there are fewer marine mammals than there are marine birds. While we're looking at this picture of this amazing giant petrel, uh, what strikes you perhaps is the huge nostrils on this bird. Um, it's obviously a member of the tube nose group, and you can see why it's called the tube noses. Um, and many species of seabirds have an incredibly acute sense of smell, uh, and they use this to locate food. They also locate their nests by scent in the case of some species that are nocturnal, returning to breeding islands at night. And I love this picture that I took some years ago, coming back from Tristan in the middle of the South Atlantic. This was a dead sperm whale. We hadn't seen a giant petrel for three days. Uh, and then we came across this dead sperm whale and suddenly it was covered in giant petrels. So these birds can smell rotting meat from hundreds of kilometers away potentially and concentrate to feed on these opportunistic um, feeding opportunities. Another reason why seabirds are so successful is that they're the most mobile organisms on the planet. So this is uh, the, the bird with the most extreme migration of any organism that we know of, the Arctic tern. And this is just showing tracking information, um, the southward migration in green, the overwintering period during the Antarctic summer, mainly in the Weddell Sea, and then the return northward migration in yellow. Um, for birds breeding in Iceland and East Greenland. Interestingly, some of these Arctic terns uh, disperse right around Antarctica all the way to South America, but then come back uh, and return back up through the Atlantic rather than hopping through the gap between um, Cape Horn and the Antarctic Peninsula. And we don't know why they do that. And one of the reasons why seabirds can be so mobile is that many of them use very energy efficient travel techniques like dynamic soaring, like this wandering albatross, um, where they can just use the differential in wind speed between wave peaks and troughs um, in order to, to basically travel for very low cost. So we can put heart rate monitors on these birds and see that when they're flying along at up to 100, 120 kilometers an hour, 
their heart rate is the same as if they were pretty much sitting on an island. It doesn't cost them much energy at all to cover these vast distances. Um, and just to show you some of the movements that these animals can make, this is a track of one wandering albatross over three successive circumnavigations of the Southern Ocean during its sabbatical year between breeding attempts. We'll talk more about that in a minute, but just gives you some idea of some wandering albatrosses living up to their name as real ocean wanderers. They can not only travel widely in space over the ocean, they can also exploit quite deeply into the ocean. Um, as you know, most of the energy um, in the ocean comes from the sun, and so it tends to be concentrated in surface waters, but resources uh, are available throughout the depths of the ocean, and some birds have adapted to be able to exploit down to quite significant depths. So the emperor penguin is the most impressive diver of any bird, attaining depths in excess of 500 meters and staying underwater for up to 23 minutes. That's fairly exceptional for a bird. Of course, that doesn't really compare with some of the marine mammals. So the dive records are held by various beaked whales. Cuvier's beaked whale recorded diving to almost three kilometers and Arnu's beaked whale staying down for about two and a half hours, um, but they are much larger organisms. And when it comes to diving performance, body size is really critical. And what you see in this graph here is, is the relationship between maximum dive depth and body mass, both on a log scale. And what's really striking about this is all marine mammals are larger than any marine birds. Um, so if you're a mammal and you want to go back into the sea, you have to have a large body size. You just can't cut it because of energetic constraints and probably the diving constraints. Birds can do it with a much smaller body size because they have much more efficient lungs. See the reptiles scattered amongst them there. If we look at dive duration in relation to body size, again, we see a nice relationship, again, with this pretty much complete divide between the mammals and the birds. But if we put the, mammal, the reptiles over that, um, you can see that for a given body size, reptiles can stay underwater for much longer, and that's because they are cold-blooded and have a much lower basal metabolic rate, so they use oxygen at a much lower rate. And in fact, some reptiles can stay underwater for months on end, um, just exchanging gas through, um, through their skin. If you're a bird, um, you can dive quite well, potentially up to hundreds of meters, um, but the dives are relatively short, and this creates challenges if you're a visual forager, as most seabirds are. Once they're diving underwater, they want to see their prey. They're not detecting it by scent or any other way. Um, and as we know, when you go down in the ocean, it gets dark quite quickly. Um, and most of our ability to compensate for changes in light intensity um, are actually come about from changes in the chemicals in the retina. So when you talk about people getting their night vision, it's a relatively slow process. Um, I like to talk about going into a cinema. When you first walk into a cinema, you can't see anything. It's pitch black and you fall over everyone's legs. But then once you've been in there for five minutes or so, you can see these poor people stumbling in and falling over other people's legs quite clearly because the chemicals in your retina have changed. Seabirds don't have the luxury of that. They might only be diving for five minutes, so they can't wait for this chemical change. So they have the most extreme pupillary response known of any organism. The king penguin has a, a pupil that allows 300 more times more light in when fully dilated than when fully contracted. And if you look at any diving seabird, whether it's a penguin or a cormorant um, out in the sunshine, you'll see that they have very, very small pupils. So the little black square in the center there is the only bit that's actually letting light into the eye of this king penguin on a nice sunny day. So its eye is designed to operate in very, very low light intensities at deep depths. Some seabirds have gone extremely aerial. Um, so probably, uh, at least in the internet, the most famous one would be the sooty tern, which is reputed to be able to fly for three or four years from the time that it leaves its colony as a, a fledgling until it returns to breed. Um, this has never really actually been confirmed. I suspect that they do pop ashore every now and then. But we do know for sure that some frigate birds, um, which are large enough to carry um, animal logging devices, um, remain on the wing for months on end um, and we know for sure that they can also sleep properly during this time although 
Uh, they typically only shut down one half of the brain at a time, a bit like dolphins are renowned for doing. Um, but they, they can actually switch off both sides of their brain for relatively short periods. But they only do this when they're high up in the sky um, and, and, and uh, they, they're quite sort of cautious about how they go about sleeping on the wing. And then, so, so that just gives us some idea of, of how these birds have made this transition back into a marine environment um, from a terrestrial existence originally. And then just focusing in more onto the Southern African perspective, um, we're very blessed in South Africa um, to have a huge diversity of seabirds. And the reason for this is we have such a diverse uh, physical oceanography surrounding our coast. So on the west coast, we have the Benguela upwelling region where we have cold, nutrient-rich water being pulled to the surface by um, southerly winds that, that force the surface waters offshore, creating upwelling. Where on the east coast, we have this warm, much less uh, productive tropical water coming down in the Agullas current and then mixing as it turns around south of the Agullas bank, creating a very diverse array of habitats. Uh, and also a, a lot of um, productivity for uh, marine organisms to feed on. One of the challenges seabirds have in our area is that there are relatively few safe places to breed. So most seabirds breed on offshore islands where they can avoid predation by terrestrial predators, typically mammals. And in the case of Southern Africa, we have a very uniform coastline with relatively few breeding opportunities. And so we have this kind of dichotomy of having huge numbers of seabirds visiting our waters. If you get the chance, I would strongly encourage you to try to go out on a pelagic trip out of Cape Town in the middle of winter. If you come across a demersal trawler, you'll see just the most amazing spectacle of thousands and thousands of seabirds attending these vessels. So we have more than 100 species of seabirds recorded from Southern Africa, which is more than 10% of the birds in the region, which is pretty impressive bearing in mind that globally seabirds make up only about 3% of all birds, but only 14 of those actually breed in the region because of this paucity of breeding sites. And so we, we have a very high proportion of non-breeding visitors, but of the 14 that do breed, seven are pretty much endemic to the region. They're all associated with the ben Benguela upwelling region. Obviously the African penguin is probably the most charismatic and well-known of those endemic species. But we also have the Cape Gannet, which is confined to only six breeding colonies, three in Namibia and three in South Africa. And unlike gannets elsewhere in the world, it breeds at very high density, again, associated with this lack of breeding space. We have three species of endemic cormorant, the Cape cormorant, which is an unusual species because it feeds pelagically and can roost on the water for hours on end, which is very unusual for a cormorant. We have the small crowned cormorant, which is an inshore feeder in the Benguela. And then we have the somewhat enigmatic bank cormorant, which is the most threatened of all of our cormorant species. And we're still not fully sure why its populations are dwindling. And it has this incredible eye, just starts off with a turquoise eye. And as it ages, the eye progresses to become brick red eventually all through on a very old bird, very unusual eye coloration change with age. Um, we have an endemic gull, the hot loves gull, and then we have uh, the little Damar return, um, which breeds mainly in Namibia, but with a few relic populations um, in the Northern Cape, uh, Western Cape, and a, actually a growing population, but very small still also in the Eastern Cape in Algoa Bay. Most of our terns uh, that we see along the coast are actually Palearctic migrants. So we get a whole bunch of species that come down from the Northern Hemisphere taking advantage of the summer flush of productivity in the Southern Hemisphere by, by migrating across the equator. Um, the terns are well known, perhaps less well known to some of you will be Sabine's gull. This is a bird that was only really discovered off Southern Africa in the 1960s, um, but is a common uh, bird in the Benguela. The Benguela is one of its two major wintering areas. Um, this is a very high, uh, tundra breeding bird. It breeds in northern Canada and Siberia um, and has wintering populations in the Benguela and the Humboldt currents. Interestingly, as one moves across the breeding range, 
Um, as you would expect, the more westerly populations winter in the Humboldt and the more easterly populations winter in the Benguela. But there's a colony that's been studied in northern Canada where a, paired, uh, a pair of birds were fitted with geolocators and one bird went to the Humboldt and one to the Benguela. So you can have birds from the same breeding colony even breeding together um, who go to entirely different ocean basins when they uh, leave the colony, which is really fascinating. We talked about how the, the Earth is uh, the blue planet, 70% water, but the Southern Hemisphere is the blue, bluer hemisphere. So 81% of the Southern Hemisphere is ocean. Um, and this is really great for us because the ocean buffers our climate. We have much less extreme climates in the Southern Hemisphere than the Northern Hemisphere as a result of this. And associated with that higher proportion of ocean, we have about 70% of seabird species occurring in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, one of the drawbacks to being again in this part of the world is that there are relatively few breeding opportunities once you go out into the ocean. Um, so there's the Tristan Goff group halfway to South America. Um, I haven't put it in, but Bouvet is sort of southwest of Africa, about halfway to Antarctica. And then Marion Island in the Prince Edward Island group is South Africa's only overseas possession. And we'll talk more about that in the course of the talk. But just as there are relatively few breeding islands close to the continent for coastal breeding birds, there are relatively few breeding opportunities for birds breeding out in these open ocean areas. And this has implications in terms of global change. Um, there are few opportunities for birds to move their ranges if they've got very few breeding islands. Because there are so few breeding islands, they tend to be really well populated. Um, so get just huge numbers of birds. This is a macaroni penguin colony with an wandering albatross in the foreground uh, on Marion Island. Um, so just the most amazing spectacle to visit these islands. Um, and BirdLife South Africa is hoping to uh, take a cruise to Marion in January 2021. If anybody's interested, they could visit the BirdLife uh, website to have a look at that, an opportunity um, to go and visit some of these amazing places, albeit only from, from the sea. There are a couple of seabirds that only occur um, associated with these islands like the Crozet Shag and the Kaguelan Tern um, and these are all covered in the seabird book because we kind of have so much overlap with the southern ocean that the, the seabird book covers all the way down to Antarctica. Um, of course Antarctica is another world entirely, um, relatively low diversity of birds but just the most amazing scenery and again if you have half an opportunity to ever visit Antarctica, I can strongly recommend it. It's really an amazing place to visit. Um, some Antarctic species make their way north in winter to get away from the really extreme Antarctic winter. Uh, and we see some of them uh, reaching the Cape occasionally in small numbers, things like the Southern former. And then finally, uh, we have some visitors from more tropical regions. There are no tropical breeding islands for seabirds in Southern Africa formally. But just outside of our 200 mile uh, sort of territorial waters in the Mozambique Channel is Europa Island, a French overseas territory, um, which has significant populations of things like red footed boobies, red tailed tropic birds, um, various frigate birds. Um, and so we get uh, a bunch of these tropical species venturing down mainly the east coast. And occasionally we get surprised by really out of range things. So a year or so ago, um, Etienne Maria was birding at the mouth of the Kai River and saw a white tern, which is a fairly common bird in places like the Seychelles, um, but has never been recorded this far south before. So one of the fun things about seabirds and their high mobility is they can pitch up pretty much anywhere. I started off by saying that seabirds are relatively modest in terms of the diversity, but they make up for this in terms of their sheer numbers. So the ocean is a large place and it can support a lot of predators, particularly at high latitudes um, where there's less competition from other marine organisms. Uh, and so we see these insane numbers of birds. These are great shearwaters coming into breed at Gough Island. Gough Island only hosts about 20% of the world population of great shearwaters. Um, the other 80% breeds at Nightingale and in accessible islands. And there the numbers coming ashore at night are truly mind boggling. Nightingale Island, um, is 
barely one square kilometer and it has over a million pairs of shearwaters breeding on. So you can imagine um, the noise uh, and the chaos when they come in to breed. And one of the really nice things about seabirds from a conservation and management perspective is because they are forced to return to land to breed, um, we can track what their populations are doing. So they give us a window into the health of the ocean, if you like. It's very difficult to use many marine organisms as indicators of ocean health because they're out there in the ocean. It's hard to get an idea of what their population size is doing. Um, but for seabirds, because they come onto land, um, predictably, we can study them quite easily. So I guess the main message of this talk is we can use seabirds as sentinels of ocean health. And until recently, what they were telling us was pretty depressing. Um, so this is a paper, a review paper from eight years ago, um, suggesting that seabirds are more threatened than other comparable groups of birds and their red list status has deteriorated faster over recent decades. This was um, a now somewhat dated State of the World Bird Report put out by BirdLife International in 2004, which had this uh, sort of overview of which are the most threatened groups of birds and a whole bunch of different groups of birds. Um, and seabirds relative to those birds were faring much worse in terms of the change in red list status over time. So through the 1990s and into the early 2000s, we saw the conservation status of seabirds deteriorate significantly. And this was really good for seabird biologists because it gave us an excuse to go and continue working on them. But obviously it wasn't good news for the seabirds themselves. And the main reason driving this big decrease through the 1990s was due to direct threats at sea, primarily longline fishing, which many of you no doubt will have heard about, but it's basically industrial scale angling. So you have ships that go out with thousands and thousands of hooks. Each of those hooks gets baited and thrown off the back of the ship. And if you do that without appropriate mitigation measures, all of the albatrosses and petrels who rely on scavenging floating material largely see this as an easy meal. So they all fly down and either swallow the hooks or get entangled in the lines and get dragged underwater and drown. And so through the 1990s, uh, this was a sort of typical picture. Here I am with, uh, well, this is Christian Boix and Keith Barnes helping me dissect a whole bunch of albatrosses and white chin petrels that came off a oriental longliner in the 1990s. And it seems like this was pretty common. The ship would return with 50, 60, 80, 100 dead birds. And to fishermen, that number doesn't sound very significant, but in terms of the seabird population dynamics, killing this number of seabirds is quite significant because they have these very conservative life histories. So any additional mortality um, is, is, uh, is a problem for these birds. And let me explain what I mean by conservative life histories. So the reason why seabirds have conservative life histories all ties back into the fact that they make these huge movements even while breeding. So again, seabirds are obliged to return to land to breed every year. Uh, and in the case of these far-flung oceanic islands, they'll then range over significant distances to go and find food. So these tracks just show a whole bunch of different species of birds breeding on Tristan and Gough and showing even while breeding, for example, the yellow-nosed albatrosses will travel to the Benguela current and feed all along the shelf from southern Angola all the way down to Cape Agulhas, um, and then go back to the island. And because they're making these huge trips, it means that they can only deliver food relatively infrequently, which means they can only raise one chick at a time. That chick grows relatively slowly, so they can only raise at most one chick per year. And in some big species like the wandering albatross, um, they only raise a chick every second year typically. If they take, if they're successful with a breeding attempt, they then take a whole year off because it takes them nearly a year to raise that one chick. Over and above that slow reproductive output, they have delayed maturity. So wandering albatrosses start coming back to the island when they're five, six, seven years old, and then they start looking for a partner and typically only start breeding when they're 10 or 11 years old. And the only way they can make a, a, a go of this in a demographic sense is to have high adult survival. 
And this combination of low fecundity, delayed maturity, and high adult survival is known as the seabird syndrome. And clearly when you start impacting the, that high adult survival, um, the populations are likely to decline. And again, because seabirds are ret returned to land, we can monitor their populations really accurately. So here's some famous data from uh, Bird Island, South Georgia, collected by the British Antarctic Survey since the 1970s, showing how the number of wandering albatrosses on the island have decreased over time. And there's great confidence in each of those estimates. Um, every pair on the island is counted each year. Um, so we're very confident that that is a real trend. So over the last 50 years or so, that population has more than halved, um, with most of the decrease occurring through the mid-1990s to the mid-2000s. And this again was linked to long-line fishing mortality. This is of considerable concern to us in South Africa because for Prince Edward Islands, we have 44% of the world's wandering albatrosses. So we have quite a significant obligation to try to conserve our wandering albatrosses and other large petrels that face the same fate. Fortunately, the population trend on Marion Island is quite different from that at South Georgia. Uh, and it seems that the Indian Ocean populations have recovered from uh, long line fishing uh, much more quickly. Uh, in, well, the South Georgia population continues to go down, or, albeit more slowly, but the Marion Island population is doing fine, as are the other populations at uh, Crozet and to a lesser extent Kerguelen. And just to, to kind of emphasize some of these changes over time, I'll quickly to show you a few pictures from Atlantic yellow-nosed albatrosses, one of the most beautiful um, small albatrosses. Um, this is on Nightingale Island in the Tristan group, a pair displaying. Um, and this is uh, one of the ponds on Nightingale where there are a couple of hundred pairs of yellow-nosed albatrosses breed taken in 2017. And if we go back in time, here we are still in 2017, but in a monochrome, and now I'm going to take you back 60 years or so to 1950. And that's what it looked like. Quite shocking how the numbers of yellow-nosed albatrosses have declined over time. So clearly this population has decreased. There's no doubt about that. That's Bunty Road on the left, for any of you who uh, might know of Bunty. She was um, Scaife's daughter. Um, here's another picture from uh, Bunty Rowan in 1950 and the matching picture now. So really a stark illustration of how these populations have declined. And as a result, the yellow-nosed albatross is listed as endangered because of very rapid ongoing decline projected over three generations. That's the criterion that's used by the IUCN. And because the generation time is so long, that means over 72 years. However, is that population decline ongoing? And here the data is much less clear. In fact, if anything, it's pretty clear that the population isn't declining anymore. So it went down during um, the latter half of the last century. Um, but since then, it's remained pretty much stable. So this is the best trend data we have for yellow-nosed albatrosses. It wobbles around a bit from a study colony on Gough Island, but there's no indication of a significant decrease on Gough over the last 40 years. So what was driving that initial decrease at Nightingale, that very alarming decrease? Well, Nightingale is harvested or was harvested by the Tristan Islanders. So in the 1950s, we don't know how many albatrosses there were, there were obviously quite a lot, but they were taking thousands of eggs and chicks and substantial numbers of adults each year. Fortunately, that population has been protected since 1976, and so that, uh, that cause of mortality has been removed. And it wasn't just the population on land that was being hammered. Um, so we have some really unique data going back to the 1930s in the Norwegian scientific expedition ringed 500 chicks at Nightingale Island in 1938 and two and a half percent of them were caught just in the first year after ringing. Most of them were caught in southern Angola, a couple off uh, Namibia and one off the south coast of South Africa. Since 1980 we've ringed five times as many chicks at uh, Tristan and Gough and only one has been caught as a first year bird. So what's going on here? Why were so many birds being caught in the 1930s? And this goes back to um, the traditional feeding of people on albatrosses in the old days. So here's a traditional cookery book from the 1950s, suggesting that uh, the white chin petrel or Cape hen 
cormorant, uh, albatrosses, and penguins were all firmly on the menu back in the 1950s. So fishermen not only were going out and catching fish, they were deliberately catching birds for food. And so what we're seeing these days is, yes, fishery bycatch is a problem, but it's probably a lot less than historical exploitation. And if we can get on top of the bycatch issue, these populations should be able to recover. A much more problematic issue to deal with is the, the question of competition with fisheries, where we are competing head to head with seabirds for the same resource. And this is the problem that faces many of our endemic seabirds on the west coast in the Binguela upwelling region, where they feed primarily on sardines and anchovies, which are also the target of a huge industrial fishery. So if we look historically at Namibia, this is showing the history of fish catches off Namibia. You can see that the amount of fish caught peaked just before 1970, and since then has declined despite attempts to try to recover this fishery. And the reason why we think that the fishery hasn't been able to recover is that there's been a complete regime shift ecologically within the northern Benguela. So by removing all of these pelagic fish from the ecosystem, we created a vacant niche which was filled by salps and jellyfish. And now the few fish that persist there, their eggs and larvae are just being eaten by this huge biomass of jellyfish and salps. So there's just not enough fish to be able to get back to the kind of state that it was because whenever they spawn, most of their eggs and larvae get eaten um, by the jellyfish. And we see a corresponding decrease in the top predators feeding in this system. So Cape Gannet pairs decreased 95% off Namibia since 1956. And it's not just the fact that there's less food. As the population becomes smaller, it becomes more susceptible to other kinds of threats. So this is Malchas Island in the West Coast National Park. The whole area used to be full of gannets. The population started to decrease because of a lack of food. But now the colony is broken up into place into, into little sub-colonies. And we find that most of the predation by terrestrial predators, such as kelp gulls, occurs around the edges of the colony. So now, instead of most of the colony being safe in the middle, there's lots of edge for these predators to get in. And so uh, this is another threat. We're also seeing a significant challenge from uh, an increasing fur seal population. So this is the fur seal colony at Lambert's Bay, right next to the uh, Cape Cormorant colony, no, Cape, Corm Cape Gannet colony. Um, and uh, as, as many of you will probably remember, uh, in the early 2000s, the seals actually entirely displaced the, the Cape Gannet colony, one of only six in the world from Lambert's Bay. And it was only through rapid intervention by Cape Nature, um, who chased the seals away, um, that that gannet colony returned the following year. And ever since then, we've had to have an active management program to keep seals from going into the colony and killing gannets. Um, at Malchas Island, uh, New Mercado's research suggests that somewhere between a third and 80% of fledglings of Cape gannets are killed each year by seals. And clearly that's not sustainable for a, a bird that only raises one chick per year. Um, so we really need active management or that population is going to go extinct. Uh, African penguin story is even more depressing than the Cape gannet story. Um, in Namibia, we see the same sort of pattern as we saw for the gannets when the fishery collapsed, the number of penguins collapsed as well, and they've remained low ever since, as you would expect, given the lack of food. In South Africa, there were more penguins to start with. Um, the first population estimate we have that's at all robust goes back to Bob Rand's work in the 1950s. Um, and by then the population was already depleted by direct exploitation. So there's this famous picture taken around the turn of the last century um, on Dasson Island. And between 1900 and 1930, 13 million penguin eggs were collected for human consumption. So that alone must have had a significant impact on this population of African penguins. And legal harvesting only ceased in 1968, just over 50 years ago. Despite cessation of harvesting, however, the African penguin population continued to decrease, mainly because of a food-related issue. So it followed the same trajectory as the population in Namibia. We then had a very encouraging um, 
recovery in the late 90s for African penguins when there were a series of very good recruitment years of anchovy, which provided more food for the penguins, more food translated into more penguins. But post 2000, we've seen a calamitous decrease in the number of African penguins. Um, and there are a number of reasons for this, but the main one is again to do with the lack of food. So we need better management of our pelagic fish resources, particularly spatial management. So um, currently most of the fishing efforts and most of the penguin populations are on the west coast where historically there was the largest population of fish. But post 2000, that fish population has shifted mainly due to uh, environmental changes to the south coast. Um, and we really need the fishing quota to match that shift. So the fishing companies should be forced to fish on the south coast and not on the west coast. Unfortunately, the penguins don't have much opportunity to respond because there's just nowhere for them to breed that's safe on the south coast. So one of the management interventions is trying to create safe havens for penguins to breed on the south coast, but that's a, an expensive and long-term solution. I just want to touch on one fun thing though, um, not fun for the penguins, but interesting, uh, and that's to do with um, the foraging behavior of African penguins. So the adults are feeding on schools of um, anchovies and sardines primarily, and their foraging efficiency is very much related to how many penguins are able to feed on the same school at once. So if a single penguin approaches a group of uh, fish, the fish remain in a polarized group and behave um, in, in, a, in a very synchronized moving pattern, which makes it difficult for them to be caught by the, the predator. So the way that African penguins and other marine predators like common dolphins um, make it easier for themselves to catch fish is that they, a whole bunch of them will circle the fish school, causing the, the, the fish to panic and no longer remain in this polarized behavior. They start to mill around um, and that makes it much easier for the penguins to, to duck in and, and grab fish. So Alistair's work with these amazing cameras on the backs of the penguins showed that when penguins are feeding in a, in a group like this, they can catch up to 10, 12 fish in a single dive, whereas when they're feeding singly, it's much more difficult. So again, it's a case of as the population becomes small, there are fewer penguins out there to help each other with the fishing. That's a bit like the, the gannet story with as the gannet numbers get smaller, it's easier for kelp girls to steal their eggs. Um, these kind of density related problems are known as alley effects and it's a fairly common problem for marine predators. So much for, for marine threats. I'm gonna move quickly on to talk about land-based threats. So historically, the, the major threat that we were able to pose to seabirds was on their breeding islands. And the reason why they breed on islands is to get away from predators. As humans evolved technology to get to these islands, they exploited this uh, wonderful bounty. Uh, so this is a just mind boggling photograph of harvesting Laysan albatross eggs on Laysan Island in the Pacific, uh, the sort of Hawaiian Northwest Pacific. Um, again, these albatrosses lay one egg per year. If you take that egg, they will not lay another one. So just the impact of collecting, you know, railroad trucks of just eggs after eggs after eggs. It's, it's amazing that lace and albatrosses persist. And yet this is one of the few non-threatened species of albatrosses in the world. Their population is still recovering from this level of exploitation. They were also heavily exploited for their feathers. Um, but as people have moved around the world, um, we've not only exploited seabirds directly. Fortunately, we've now largely stopped doing that because we value seabirds for their role in ecosystems uh, as, as well as their intrinsic value. But we've unfortunately introduced a whole suite of invasive mammals onto islands as well. So these are no longer safe havens for seabirds. And this is a, just a graphic showing you which are the major invasive species on islands that cause problems for threatened species. And you can see that cats are number one, followed by black rat, then dog, pig, another rat, etc., etc. We're fortunate that we don't have problems um, with any of these on our major islands. Um, but at the Prince Edward Islands, South Africa's only overseas territory, as I said, in the sub-Antarctic, um, we do have an issue with mice. So house mice were introduced by sealers around 1800 to Marion Island 
Fortunately, the sealers who visited Prince Edward were a little more fastidious and didn't introduce mice, um, for which we can be extremely grateful. Uh, the islands were annexed by South Africa in 1947. This is the current weather base, the new one on the right and the old one on the left. And shortly after annexation, the weather station staff were getting annoyed with mice running around uh, the kitchen and the lounge. So they took a few cats down to control the mice at the base. And by 1970, we had 2,000 cats roaming the island, killing 450,000 birds each year. This led to several species becoming locally extinct on Marion Island. Common diving petrels and a couple of species of storm petrel disappeared entirely. And by the end of the 1970s, it was estimated that the numbers of burrowing birds on Marion Island were about 20 times less per unit area than on Prince Edward. So the cats had an enormous impact on these uh, nocturnal burrowing birds in particular. So a decision was made to get rid of the cats. Um, there was initially a feline flu was introduced, which knocked the population down by about half. And then we had these crazy characters who were employed to go and shoot cats. So they had to roam around the island at night with spotlights in all weathers, shooting cats, it's pretty hardcore activity. And they managed to get the population down to a few hardy, uh, canny individuals. And then uh, there was a, had to resort to a, a variety of other approaches, trapping and, uh, and poisoning to get rid of the last cats. But fortunately, the effort was sustained over more than a decade, led by Martin Bester. And eventually the last cat was killed in 1990 and uh, the island has remained cat free ever since. Unfortunately, this left mice as the only introduced mammal on the island once again. And we didn't really think that mice were a major problem for seabirds at this time. So we knew that they had a significant impact on plants on the island. Um, they have a very big impact on invertebrates. They love snacking on the flightless moths and weevils, which are endemic to the island. Um, but we didn't think they were a major threat to seabirds. That changed um, after 2000 when Richard Cuthbert spent a year on Gough Island and discovered that the mice on Gough were pretty significant predators of seabird chicks. This is a great shearwater chick being eaten alive by a house mouse on Gough Island. And post 2015, we've seen a massive increase in attacks by mice on albatrosses on Marion Island. Um, and so 2015 was an unusually warm, dry year on Marion and it allowed the mouse population to get a very high level. And that year we just saw attacks on, these are all gray-headed albatross chicks that just about to leave the island. Um, and it's late in summer and the mice are running out of food and they resort to eating the albatrosses. As I've already said, um, the Prince Edwards are incredibly important for wandering albatrosses. Marion alone is home to a quarter of the world's wandering albatrosses. And again, uh, the mice really climb into these birds late uh, in, in, in autumn and into winter when they have these small chicks. Um, so this is Stefan Scooby's horrific picture of a wandering albatross chick being scalped by a mouse. And this bird died overnight. Fortunately, there's something we can do about this. Um, so the New Zealanders have come up with uh, a solution to these invasive mammals on islands. Um, the New Zealanders have the biggest set of problems with invasive mammals because New Zealand was largely mammal free before people arrived there. And, and so their uh, native populations are particularly vulnerable to introductions. Um, and for large islands like Marion, the only real approach that we have at the moment is to use helicopters to spread poison bait across the whole island. This is a, a photograph from Macquarie Island, uh, an, an Australian subantarctic island, which was cleared of rats, mice and rabbits um, in 2009. Since then, South Georgia has been cleared of rats. And more recently, the Antipodes Islands have been cleared of mice. So there's lots of successful stories out there of doing this. And we're currently fundraising for uh, an attempt to eradicate mouse from Marion. Um, if you want to go to the Mouse Free Marion website, feel free to go and have a browse there, find out how this is going. 
And then finally, as if there weren't <laughs> enough problems, um, there are a bunch of new problems that are emerging. So disease is an issue for seabirds. Again, probably mediated in some cases, at least by people spreading disease around. So we have breakouts um, killing particularly large numbers of cormorants in some years. Um, avian cholera is problematic. Um, a two years ago, we had a outbreak of avian influenza in the Western Cape, which killed really big numbers of swift terns, but significant numbers of gannets and smaller numbers of African penguins and Cape cormorants. Probably the most uh, cautionary of tales with regards to disease in seabirds from Saddam Island, which is a French island in the middle of the Indian Ocean between Madagascar and Australia. And here, you can see the, the breeding success of yellow-nosed albatrosses is, is just way lower than it is um, on, on Gough or, or Tristan. So they're just not producing enough chicks. And most of these chicks are dying as a result of um, avian cholera. And that's the population trend as a result. So we've seen a steady decrease over the last 40 odd years. And the French only have themselves to blame. They had poultry on the island for many years. And it's thought that the uh, cholera got from the poultry that they kept on the base into the seabird populations. So one of the abiding lessons from this is we have to be very careful about how we manage these remote places to ensure that we don't accidentally introduce things that shouldn't be there. And then finally, um, the elephant in all conservation rooms these days is climate change. Um, so we have issues with temperature extremes, things like African penguins nesting out on the surface because they've lost their guano cap to burrow into. Um, if it gets above 30, 35 degrees for any sustained period, I often abandon their nests. So you see a lot of abandoned eggs around African penguin colonies early in the breeding season in late summer. We're seeing increasingly severe storms associated with climate change, which leads to uh, storm swell surges, soil erosion, landslips. Uh, many of the birds breed in, in peat. Um, if that peat gets washed away by storms, um, they can't burrow into the ground anymore. Um, so there's a whole bunch of problems there. In the tropics in particular, many seabirds breed on low-lying atolls uh, and with sea level rise set to change, by maybe 10 to 20 meters over the next century or so. Um, that's very distressing um, for, for many of the birds that rely on, on those low-lying islands. And for birds like um, king penguins on Marion Island, which already feed mainly about 400 kilometers south of Marion while they're feeding chicks, as the climate warms, we're seeing that the, the fronts where they feed are being pushed further south. So it's forcing the king penguins to commute further south while feeding their chicks. And it's becoming um, almost not profitable for them to actually breed at somewhere like Marion. They're having to shift to islands further south. So we're seeing the population in places like Heard Island increasing. But for the birds on Marion, there is no option to go further south. There's nothing between Marion and Antarctica. And finally, as we've just talked about, um, climate change can also make the impacts of invasive species worse. On Marion, it took 20 odd years before the mice really became a problem. And we think that's because it took that long for the climate to get warm and dry enough for the mice densities to get high enough at the end of the summer for them to start attacking birds. Okay, so that's my story. Um, I think it's a mixed one in terms of good news and bad news. So the good news is seabirds are more resilient than you might think. Um, yes, we're killing them on long lines and on trawl lines, but relative to what we were doing deliberately in the past, it's relatively minor. And with appropriate mitigation, we can get the populations to recover. Um, where it's more problematic is where they're competing directly for food with people and um, that's, that's a much more difficult one to deal with because there's no incentive for fishermen to reduce their catches in, in situations like that. So that requires strong top-down management. In terms of land-based threats, I think um, there's some encouraging news. We can restore these breeding islands and if we do so, the populations will and can recover and that's really exciting. So that's my story for this morning. I haven't been watching the time. I hope that you're still all out there and have enjoyed it. Um, and I'd uh, just like to thank all of the students and colleagues who worked with me on this adventure over the last 30 odd years of working on seabirds. 
um, and I was asked to put up this slide as a little advert. Um, so the seabird guide covers all of the seabirds of South Africa, uh, Namibia and Mozambique and right down to Antarctica. It's a nice slim little photo guide that's packed with the kinds of stories that I've been regaling you with today, hopefully. Uh, and then there's obviously the new edition of Sassel, which came out earlier this year, um, which features fancy peacocks, amazing new artwork of all the seabirds, which is a really wonderful resource. If you do manage to get out to sea, um, to help you identify seabirds. They can be a little challenging on first vision, but uh, once you've spent time with them, uh, they get into your blood and uh, they can become quite addictive. So thank you very much for your attention. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, Professor Peter Ryan, um, he is uh, currently the director at UCT and he mainly focuses and oversees the conservation biology. Um, he works mainly on seabirds um, and is well known for many of his articles and uh, books on birds uh, and their conservation. And the slide that you see in front of you is all about that. Um, uh, Professor Peter, as, a, as an academic, he's quite easily accessible. Um, you know, all you have to do is just Google search him, um, his name comes up and you can pose direct questions to him. Uh, Prof, thank you so much. Your passion and the work that you do is absolutely breathtaking. I think uh, you've covered the, the topic in such a vast scientific and, and basic ways. You've just mixed science, research, and just um, a general you know, observations of, of some of us who are not working in the direct field like you do. And you've brought this information in such an easy and understandable way and, and really make us think about you know, what's gonna happen to, to the future in the next coming years. So thank you, very much for, for, thank you very much for the work that you do. And we salute you and we, we, we you know, encourage you to continue doing the great work that you do and we look forward to definitely chatting to you again uh, in the near future. So um, with that said, uh, let me start with a quick opening question. So uh, something that's been fascinating to me for, and, and I'm really wanting to, to understand what's going on. In your research looking at seabirds, have you ever come across mermaids or is that a myth? Uh, uh, as you ponder on that question, <laughs> let me tell you quickly who we've got here. We've got people from all over, literally, the world. We've got guys from Scotland, UK. Uh, we've got Madimole um, out in, 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 in Gauteng province. We've got Hot Bay. We've got Johannesburg. We've got Sedgefield. We've got Durban so many people so i'd like to thank everybody that has taken time to join us this um uh, this morning uh, to listen to this wonderful talk so peter please uh, tell us currently what's happening with the uh, conservation what should people do um immediately in order to you know to be active citizens and also please brief us quickly on on the mermaids issue <laughs> yeah um yeah, I think, um, you know, these, these early sealers, when they went to islands, um, would be dropped off with a few staves of wood to make barrels to put the, the seal oil in and a bit of salt to cure the skins. And they were dumped there with, with no certainty as to when they were going to get picked up again. So um, they were living under pretty tough conditions, and I, I think their imaginations ran riot. Um, so after a, maybe a year on Marion with with no companionship, maybe a female elephant seal starts looking attractive and, uh, you know, hence the mermaid story. But um, yeah, I'm, I, I certainly haven't come across any sirens uh, while, while doing this work in the Southern Ocean. Awesome stuff. And, um, and just um, as, as, as part of um, active citizenship, um, what can we do as the, just the general public in order to you know, contribute to the type of work that you do? So I think one of the, one of the really important initiatives has been the SASE initiative, which is the, the sort of orange, green, red rating of, of fish. So, um, you know, making sure that the seafood you eat is sourced sustainably is, is really important for the health of the oceans in general. 
um, supporting initiatives to try to conserve seabirds um, and their habitats, uh, you know, more broadly. Um, you know, if you're interested in birds, consider joining BirdLife South Africa. They do amazing work uh, and they need all of our support. You know, the more, the more members BirdLife has, the more of a voice we have for bird conservation in the region. I think that's, that's a really important thing that we can all do. Uh, you know, and it comes with really nice benefits, like you can get the uh, African BirdLife magazine six times a year, which is packed full of interesting stories. Um, so yeah, maybe there's a bunch of things that one can do, but ultimately we, we all need to be very aware of our, of our footprint on the planet and try to, to keep it down. Ultimately, there's too many people on the planet, so we have to tread lightly as individuals. Definitely. All right. Um, we, we have, um, I think uh, a lot of the, the, um, the comments that we have is just general comments, um, uh, Peter, just about, you know, the wonderful talk that you've, that you've presented. Um, a lot of it is, is literally great comments. Everybody's saying thumbs up, you know, they really love the work that you do. Um, we don't have um, a specific question, so, but I think I've got um, one particular here from Vanessa who says, our government and fisheries uh, at all receptive uh, to moving operations to the south coast or is there currently very uh, are they currently much very resistance um, wouldn't likely um, I'm just trying to reach this carefully wouldn't likely increased increased catch uh, be a big enough incentive or is it too linked to specific uh, fishing communities I don't know if you got that right Peter yeah sure um, so <sighs> Yeah, it's, it's tricky. I mean, they're, they're obviously the, 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 the fishing companies targeting uh, the small pelagic fish have a lot of infrastructure invested in the West Coast. And so to move it to the South Coast is a costly exercise. Having said that, they really struggle to meet their quotas. Um, what we've mm. been doing um, uh, since more than a decade now, there's been what's known as the island closure experiment, where... Um, paired islands in Algoa Bay and on the west coast, so Dasson and Robin and Bird Island and St. Croix um, have been alternately protected and unprotected. So uh, a 20 kilometer no fishing buffer was placed around the islands um, and then switched between the islands between years. And mm. the idea was to show that not fishing close to penguin colonies benefited penguins. Um, oh. and uh, you know, it was a really nicely designed experiment. It ran uh, for more than 10 years. Um, it showed pretty conclusively to any objective scientist that there was a very clear signal of, um, of, of benefit. If you stop fishing close to penguin colonies, the penguins do better. Their foraging chips are shorter. Their chicks grow more quickly. Um, you know, so, so there, was, there was a very compelling case to be made. But unfortunately, um, you know, the, the industry is also quite defensive about these things and they employed um, consultants who argued on statistical grounds that, you know, that there were issues with various technical statistical concerns around this. And the whole process has become mired in controversy um, as the statisticians duke it out. Um, you know, the, one, of, one of the issues was that the buffer wasn't big enough. Um, so really we should have been looking at a 30 or 50 kilometer buffer and it's, it's not sufficient to actually protect the, the colony, you know, just during the breeding season. So one of the other critical periods for African penguins in particular is the pre-molt fattening period. So as you know, yeah. penguins have a catastrophic molt where they come ashore and, and live off stored reserves for about three to four weeks. And if they don't have enough stored reserves, they die. Um, so, you know, and that, that isn't helped by, um, by putting a small buffer around breeding colonies. Um, it turns out that uh, many of the juveniles are programmed when they leave the colonies to go up the west coast. Again, historically, that was where the fish was concentrated, so it makes evolutionary sense. Um, but mm. it doesn't make sense these days. So they go off up towards Namibia and they find these relatively fish-free sterile waters. Um, and we're seeing low 
juvenile uh, survival as a result of that. So, so there's there's a whole a whole suite of problems. But bottom line is, we we definitely should be having spatial management of that fishery. Um, the conservationists have been calling for it. It's required under South African legislation, which says that there should be a, uh, an, an ecosystem approach to fishing, which requires yeah. that. Uh, a, a proportion of fish is left in the sea for predators um, but you know it's just not translating into policy and, and unfortunately that's a, that's a failure within um, the government department responsible for that. Sure. All right um, we're running we, we're running fast and furious out of time uh, but I'm just going to take perhaps maybe two more questions um, uh, Peter and I think we'll just wrap it up. Um, I think you've covered uh, the question about uh, the ocean and uh, climate change and um, you know how that affects seabirds. Uh, uh, two questions just to follow on that. It says, uh, please explain a molly harvest. And um, the other one, it says, are they making any progress in managing uh, pilchard or uh, sardine fisheries? I noticed that uh, pilchards going on to the SASSI orange list a few years ago already. Um, and perhaps maybe let me just take this uh, two last ones as well. And how serious is the latest trend of cutting albatross beaks uh, by fishermen? Um, and also the last one, um, is it uh, viable to guide or to build artificial platforms uh, of the coast to, to encourage uh, breeding uh, of the seabirds? Uh, just the uh, quickly uh, literally in one minute uh, Mr. Peter, let's do this. <laughs> yeah sure sorry my phone's ringing because there's somebody at the door um i'm trying to just kill uh i don't know what i'm doing anyway um i can't turn this phone off i'm afraid <laughs> um so uh, there, there were like four questions there, so I'll have to take them backwards. Building platforms, yes. Um, yes. So creating artificial habitat definitely can work. Um, it's been done quite successfully for, for creating guano uh, exploitation in Namibia and in Peru. Um, the mm -hmm. challenge we face in South Africa is we have a very exposed coastline with high wave action, so it's not an easy engineering solution. Um, so yeah, but you know it's 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 sort of fine in principle, but difficult in practice. Um, what we're doing with the African penguin is is creating um, sort of predator-proof havens along the coast. So there's a, a, a pilot project in uh, in De Hoop Nature Reserve near Cape Infanta, where a headland has been fenced off. Um, but it's you know it's a, it's it's a long-term management headache because you have to maintain that fence to prevent predators getting over and particularly around. So with tidal, you know, when the tide goes really low, there's a, there's the scope for somebody to slip around the edge. And um, so again, it's, mm. it's difficult to do. Um, sardine management, yeah, so sardine is part of the, the small pelagic fishery with, with anchovy. Most of the catch these days is anchovy. So historically it was sardine. And then we had a flip-flop due, probably due to overfishing of the sardine. And now we have primarily anchovy in South Africa. Um, it's, it's difficult to manage because they, the fishermen are not sure what they're targeting. So there are limits on how much sardine they can catch. Um, but because it gets caught in with this, the anchovy often, um, there's a whole bunch of, of, you know, fisheries are full of dodgy and corrupt practices. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, quotas are set with the best of intentions uh, and then fishermen come up with ways to circumvent them. Uh, and I'm afraid I didn't start scribbling down the first two questions. So what were the first two again you wanted me to touch on? All right. So uh, we have uh, the one about the explanation about the, the molly harvest um, and also um, the trends uh, of cutting albatross beaks uh, by fishermen. Okay. How serious yeah. uh, is this latest trend? Um, so uh, molly harvest, molly is just the, is just the sort of island name for a, an albatross. So, um, you know, the, the people living on Tristan um, during the 1920s, they went nearly a decade without seeing a, a boat from the outside world, had no contact with the outside world. So, you know, they went through really tough times and they, they had to live off the land. And so mm -hmm. they, you know, they, one of the major resources that they made use of on the islands was using seabirds as food. And so, you know, that, that became entrenched as, as uh, 
as part of their way of life. Uh, and so every year they would make a trip to some of the other islands to collect the eggs or the chicks of different seabirds at different times of the year. So that's just the yeah. molly, molly is just albatross harvest. Um, fortunately, mm. now, now uh, not no longer allowed. Um, okay. uh, and then the other one was the business of collecting beaks. I think it's largely um, opportunistic. So I don't think that they target seabirds specifically to, to cut their beaks. But if, you know, if one gets pulled up on a line and then you see this pretty bill, I think some fishermen kind of go, oh, that's kind of sweet. Let's make a, a keychain or something out of it. But um, mm -hmm. I, 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 as far as I know, if anybody has any other information to the contrary, um, I, you know, it's obviously not something we would want to encourage. Um, but again, BirdLife's working quite hard to try to work with fishermen to educate them as to the sensitivity of these populations. Mm. Um, let me just uh, cover this last. I think, um, Peter, I think we've kept you um, with us for quite a bit. And, uh, uh, you know, we still have the whole attendees online just listening to some of the, you know, to how you answer some of the questions. So again, let me just thank you um, for this wonderful opportunity that you've presented to us. Um, thank you for granting us with your presence. Um, and also on the last uh, screen that you see, ladies and gentlemen, um, the Guide to Sea Birds of South Africa, uh, written by yours truly, uh, Professor Peter Ryan, uh, and the Sasol Birds of Southern Africa. This is the fifth edition, and it's available in Afrikaans and English. Um, we also have a PVC uh, covered ed edition. Uh, they are all available at a discounted rate at the Kistenbosch uh, Book Club. You get 15%, uh, you know, we're keeping up with the trend of Black Friday. Uh, and we're maintaining this, um, uh, this discount uh, to everybody that's attended here today. And if you tell your friends about it, um, we'll keep quiet and still offer you the discount. Um, I think um, we've got uh, Christmas coming up. Um, there's such a, a world of, of, of knowledge and, and the description of birds uh, that are in here. I think this is a, it's a wonderful resource to have. Um, we also have... Um, Guide to Sea Birds of um, uh, Southern Africa. So please go on ahead and get yourself this book. I think this is going to make a wonderful um, Christmas gift for someone. And also when you're out in the sea looking at the different birds, you can always take out your book and then just see uh, what kind of bird it is and the history about the bird and you know um, uh, the impact on, on the biodiversity that we have in this world. So thank you very much uh, to everybody uh, that's attended the talk today. Um, we look forward again uh, to welcome you again in the last Wednesday of January, which would be, um, I think the last Wednesday, I'm not too sure what date it would be, um, of January 2021. And, um, you know, welcoming you again with a wonderful speaker. So please uh, keep your, um, you know, tuned onto our Facebook pages, uh, the Straight Nature Facebook page, Room to Grow, as well as the Kistenbosch Facebook page for more uh, information about the next talks that will be coming in 2021. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we wish you a Merry Christmas, a blessed festive season. We wish you all a prosperous 2021 coming up. And um, let's all uh, do our best to stay safe. Um, uh, the whole world is faced by this new second uh, pandemic or second wave of COVID-19. So let's do our best to, to, to stay safe and protect ourselves and protect others. And um, let's all come back together in 2021, refreshed, well-rested, um, looking forward to the beautiful year that we've got ahead. Uh, Prof, thank you very much for the work that you do. Thank you to all the team. Um, uh, you know, that you work with, uh, for putting all these wonderful things uh, together. Let me also take this opportunity to thank uh, the Straight Nature team uh, for just making this webinars possible. You know, Belinda and her team working behind the scenes just to make sure that, you know, all these talks that we've got, you know, they, they happen uh, without, you know, glitch free. Um, so thank you very much to the team. Kathy Abbott and your team, um, we, we can't express our gratitude to you, Kathy, um, for being able to put together this program. You work tirelessly in making sure that this program runs smoothly, 
our guests know what they're presenting. Uh, so thank you very much to you and your team for making this possible. And from Kirsten Boss side, uh, our focus uh, this year, it's all about um, you know, safety. We want to encourage everybody to come and visit the garden. Uh, we will be focused on uh, absolute safety. It will be safety for yourselves and your family. So come and enjoy the gardens. Make sure you've got your you've got your mask when you're working on the paths. But otherwise, once you're seated and having your picnic, uh, you are more than welcome to just sit and enjoy in a safe uh, environment. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, that's all from me. Thank you very much for uh, giving me the privilege of uh, presenting some of the uh, the talks. Um, it's been a great honor and a pleasure working with the whole team. So until we meet again, have a blessed festive season and a prosperous 2021. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy your holidays. <laughs>